Hey, what's up, everybody? And thank you for listening to Operation Agency Freedom, where we are bringing you top secret advice from the world's most badass digital agency owners. These amazing men and women are sharing their stories of how they have built six, seven, and eight figure digital agencies and how you can too. My name is Chris Martinez, CEO of Dude, where we help digital agencies by giving them the people and the processes. Joined by a Canadian genius, the Amanda Bond from The Ad Strategist and the creator of The Strategy System is on the show. Welcome, Amanda. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. That intro, whoa, whoa, I liked it. The energy, I've never been called a Canadian genius. Woof. Well, okay, <laughs> Let's just, I'm just gonna call you a genius. You're, you're an earth genius. Perfect, okay. Maybe there's a Facebook ad strategist on Mars or another yeah. planet. But for all intents and purposes, you are it. I'm very, very excited Perfect. to have you on the show. Um, and, you know, we've heard a lot about you. You spoke at Traffic and Conversion last I year. I did. I mean, you're doing a lot of things right. And I can't wait to get into your story and uh, how you got started. And I know that you, um, you had the agency and now you, you, uh, did you, you sold it. You had an exit. Uh, no, nope, we've just pivoted ways. And so now we actually work with other ads managers and other ad strategists through our digital program and awesome. refer over to them now. So we're like an agency's best friend. That's awesome. <laughs> so we're going to get all into that story, but you know, we start off every show, we have a little round table discussion and I am super excited about this topic because it's something that I actually experienced as well when I was in university. So in college, they yep. have these companies and they go around and they say, hey, run your own business, create an exterior home painting or run an exterior home painting business uh, in the summer months and make a bunch of money and whatever. And you were one of those people that actually took on that challenge. So tell us about that experience when you were uh, in uni. Well, I mean, you literally just summarized it. We had somebody show up to our university and they said, hey, do you want to come do this business thing? And as a person who was always entrepreneurial, 100% I wanted to do it. The first year I actually ended up just painting for another franchisee because, I mean, it was the, the brand was called College Pro Painters and they were a franchise. So the first year I was a painter and I was the person that always thought our franchisee, I was like, oh, I could do that better. You could oh, do better, yeah. I, yep. I could paint that better. Oh, I could run that system better. And so here I was just like constantly criticizing this person that was probably doing wonderful, just not in my own eyes. Right. And then the next year I decided to step it up and, and run a franchise in my hometown. So did you actually have to pay like a franchise fee to get started or was it just like, hey, here you go, just go get houses? <laughs> That I can recall, I don't believe there was an upfront franchise fee, but they took okay. a pretty significant, I believe it's like 24% of revenues um, oh, wow. as a franchise fee as you got started. So like definitely as soon as you were booking work and getting your deposits, like they were like, oh, hey, 24% of those deposits. Oh, hey, 24% of the work you collect. Right. Um, yeah. So they, they had their, their like free plus shipping plan. Like in their, you know, nice. in their own world, going pretty strong. <laughs> That's awesome. So here's my experience with that. So like, I didn't own a franchise, but I was desperate and I was looking for a summer job. Yes. And um, I, I went to college in Santa Barbara in California. So it was a beautiful college town. And so they run the ads in the school paper. And this is before the internet, actually. right? So it seems like forever ago. They run the ads, you know, like make uh, $500 a week painting houses. And I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. So I answer the ad and it, it's, a, it's a student. And I remember that I didn't know he was a student because I think he was probably 22, but he looked like he was like 45. I was like, God damn, man, you are not aging well. <laughs> so anyway, so I go up and I apply, you know, and I was like, I've never really done this before. And he's like, okay, well, here's a brush. You know, you start on Monday. So I get there and we have a house and it's, uh, you know, this little old lady, she had hired the college kid. You know, I don't know. Do you remember what the pricing was for the house? That, oh, like how they did the pricing? Sure they had, like square foot. Yeah, they had such like an elaborate pricing thing where based on your window type, based on like the siding, the square footage, based on like if you were doing soffits and fascia, I think it's mm -hmm. called, if I like remember the outside 
parts of a house, all of those things were taken into account. And so it was actually a very involved like investment process. And then you like tallied stuff on a list to like add it all up and be like, I guess it's going to cost this much. <laughs> I mean, that's like now looking at that, it's like ingenious that they were right. able to do that. So what a yes, system. <laughs> exactly. So, and so they, you know, they hired me to come and paint the house and it was me and another guy. And basically, we spent the whole week painting the exterior of this house. The, the prep, of course, is if you've ever oh. painted before, the prep is what sucks. Yeah. And we had to sand or whatever. And I'd go home and I would just pass out because yeah. I was so exhausted. You're like, your fingers are raw from the sandpaper and you yep. probably have splinters and like mm -hmm. you're just already covered with dust. And oh, yeah, it's bad. And uh, I remember this house, there were bees. So I was just terrified about it. I didn't get stung, but I was like really scared. And so anyways, so my painting career was very, very short because <laughs> on the last day of the job, we had two sides of this house to paint. So I was on one side of the house, the guy was on the other, the other guy was on the other side. And there was a big piece of plywood laying against the wall of the house. And instead of moving the plywood, the guy painted <gasps> over the plywood. <laughs> so there was a big rectangle, perfect rectangle of the old paint. So when the owner came by and checked it out, he's like, what the hell is this? Um, and there were some other things that we missed. So I Amazing. clearly, horrible. I got fired after a week. Yeah, fair. <laughs> I definitely fair. deserved it. Definitely deserved it. But that was my very short. You needed a little more extensive training process, it sounded like back then. Yeah, there was zero training. <laughs> fair, fair. Zero training. So yeah. I don't know. Maybe. Uh I, I loved it from, uh, from a standpoint of being a painter, what they would do is they would estimate a job and then let's say it's going to take 80 hours. If you can get it done in 60, you're still getting paid for 80 hours, right? Yeah, so like, I love that from a technician standpoint. Mm -hmm. But then once I actually got to be a franchisee, I learned that I really sucked at managing a business at the first like little while. So I made more money as a painter because I could do that technician work and be faster and more efficient. But yeah. the learning curve being a franchisee, even moving into like being an agency owner was so large that like I've messed it up so many times along the way. Oh man, that's awesome. How many, uh, do you remember how much money you made when you were the franchisee? Uh, that summer, I think I booked 70 grand in work. And so 70 grand in proposals that were yeah. like booked deposits down. And I think we only produced like 50 of it. And this is a summer period in Canada. Yeah. So like May till end of August. Um, so and then you remember what your take home was for that? I literally could barely pay my bills because this was back when I didn't realize you should have an account for business and have an account for personal. So I, I lived well that summer, but then at the end nice. of the summer, I owed money back. <laughs> oh, wow. What yeah. an amazing learning experience though. Absolutely. All right. So this is a perfect segue. Let's get into your agency story. Yeah. Um, so I'll let you start, you know, like how did you get into this crazy digital agency world? Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously you can tell that I was already entrepreneurial if I was going to take on a franchisee at the ripe old age of 21. Um, yes. So it just kind of continued from there. I was always listening to like motivational videos. I was reading the self-help books. I got involved in network marketing for a while, which then, you know, it's that like entrepreneurial vein that keeps running through it all. Oh yeah. I sold, I sold a uh, quest longer, long distance. Oh, there you go. So, uh, so there I know you what go. you're talking about. I was an Arbonne consultant back in the day and grew a uh, sizable small team there. Um, and so I just kind of followed those paths all the way through until about the end of my twenties when I joined our local rotary club, which is a charitable club locally that, that helps, um, local and international initiatives. Mm -hmm. And because I was the youngest person in the group by like decades in some cases, they said to me, oh, you should do our social media, right? Like just naturally, you're younger, you know the Twitter. Right. Um, <laughs> so I started running the club social media and we had this like food truck frenzy event locally, okay. uh -huh. which was this food truck, well, there's 15 food trucks that came in. We expected like 3000 people to show up. Well, through $200 in Facebook ad budget, Twitter and their Facebook page, I definitely was part of the catalyst that brought in 23,000 people through the gates that weekend. Wow. Caused They're... its own issues of itself when you're expecting 3,000 and 20 extra thousand people show up, but that's yeah. the point. <laughs> wow. 
So that's how your career got started. I mean, at what point did you decide, hey, you know, this is something that I can, I can actually turn into a business? Well, when people started trying to hire me before I was even ready, they're like, wait, you did that? Will you do this? And I'm like, what, what do you mean? You're going to give me money to do this? And they're like, literally take it. <laughs> like, go, run. I want this to happen. So I'm apparently from even an early age, innately strong at marketing, uh -huh. um, which is what parlayed me into being a social media manager. And then again, it was just pivoting, following the ROI of it all, okay. and then doubling down on Facebook ads because you know social media is great and all, but if you can't prove that it's leading to revenue, like customers aren't gonna keep you on. So I pivoted towards that ROI, um, and then the ad strategist agency was born a few years back. So what year did you officially launch the ad strategist agency? Uh, it was two, it was either 2014 or 2015. I'm getting confused now because we're almost in 2020. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Which in reality, it's really not that long ago, but in no. internet, in internet years, it's like three decades. Basically. Correct. Correct. Because things change at the speed of light. Right. Right. So yeah. like when you officially launched the ad, uh, the ad strategist, did you already have clients? Did you have a strategy uh, as terms of like, who are you going to work with and what you're going to do? Like, what does that look like back when you get started? So I had clients from the social media world. And then I read the book, The Pumpkin Plan. Have you read that one? I read it like six uh, months ago. I absolutely yes. love that book. Love, love. Highly recommend The Pumpkin Plan. Pumpkin Plan. I read it and that just gave me the catalyst I needed to make that pivot towards Facebook ads. Mm -hmm. Because before, well, if you haven't read the book, the premise is the way to grow clients is like growing prize winning pumpkins. And mm -hmm. one of the steps is like culling away all the pumpkins that don't have the potential to grow. Yep. So for me, that looked like going to this coffee roaster that was our social media client that I spent a dollar a day on boosting their posts uh, on the Facebook ad side. And I was like, okay, that's not my bread and butter client. And then a politician <laughs> who I was doing graphic design for, and I have no business doing graphic design. So, okay, we're going to end that client contract. And there was this uh, Facebook group back in 2014 that I was a part of where I was starting to be exposed to this world of internet marketing. And I essentially just started Googling Facebook ad answers to the questions that people were asking in this Facebook group. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, as a result, people just started tagging me in anything Facebook ads related, which allowed me to carve out this little niche in yeah. the digital course world. So once I went all in on the Facebook ad side of the equation, removed the social media management, um, that was where I found this little niche and went all in on. So launching digital courses, the masterminds that come from that, mm -hmm. every kind of sales sequence and funnel that you've seen like under the sun, I've helped run over the years. What are some of your most successful campaigns? Uh, my like favorite story is when we did a hundred or seven hundred thousand dollars in a single day on uh, on a cart open for a blogging program of all things, like something that I didn't realize was such a market. So that's a really fun story. Um, you know, just just seeing behind the scenes of launches, it can be exciting and exhilarating. And command R is my favorite activity to do in the launch world. You know what command R is? No, I was just about to ask you. I've never heard that term before. When you just go on your MacBook and you hit refresh, refresh, refresh and watch uh, your stats okay. update. <laughs> See, I'm a PC guy, so I don't oh, know. Oh, okay. What, what's, what's the PC? You don't have a, you don't have a uh, refresh button? What, what do you do to copy and paste on a PC? Uh, control V. Maybe it's control R then for a PC. So okay. control R, command R, just launching and, uh, you know, being filled with that excitement. But then on the flip side, like those things also led to a lot of burnout for ourselves, our clients, uh, the industry in general. So I've kind of seen a whole gamut of things along the way. Wow. So, you know, you've had another pivot, like you said, and now you're uh, teaching other people how to do what you did and have that same sort of success. Um, when you spoke at TNC, I mean, it was like standing room only. Like you said, they had to shut the door. So what did you teach? Like, what was it that you were teaching that just had everybody basically at TNC who wanted to get a piece of this action? Yeah, well, 
the, the biggest takeaway that I have for anyone listening to this, who's running an agency right now is what we taught was our individual specific framework that we came up with for how we do business, for how we get results. When I first started my agency and actually when we started bringing on ads managers to help support the client accounts and run the ads, I didn't have a framework. I didn't have an understanding of why the things that I did in my own head, like all the buttons that I personally pressed, was why I was pressing those buttons. So what I found is it was super challenging to teach other people and to, to teach our team members mm -hmm. to do what I did because I didn't even know it. But what we taught at TNC was how to take the attention that you get online already. So either through your Facebook ads, through YouTube, Pinterest, organically, like whatever it's coming from, take that attention and turn it into revenue on autopilot using automated Facebook ad sequences. And so that's become our framework. And as an agency, it was the thing that allowed us to go from charging retainers of anywhere between 2000, actually they started at like 1200. And then at one point we were up to $3,000 a month retainer mm -hmm. with then a certain percentage of ad spend, which led us to have clients that were five figure a month clients, multi five figure a month clients, because we had a framework that was specific to us. So we could say like, listen, we're in strategy. We do this this way. And here's how your business model and your framework fits into ours. So don't just tease us with that. Let's, let's <laughs> give us some, give us some details about what is inside of the, the framework. You know, I yeah. don't know if you want to give it all, but I, tell I was, us what's, what's included in this framework. Absolutely. And it's, I'm going to share because it's so simple. And a lot of people think, Oh, if I share my trade secrets, if I share like the way that I specifically do things, then other people are going to rip me off. Like, I'm going to say this and I hope you change the way that you do ads into these three simple phases because ads are just foundational marketing principles with digital tools. That's all it is, right? So our Love framework that. breaks down to this. You, there's three phases. You connect with people, you get them to make a micro commitment, and then you ask them to close, right? Connect, mm -hmm. commit, close. Otherwise known as growing your warm custom audiences so that mm -hmm. they are in your retargeting pool. Then the people that already know, like, and trust you through that warming up process, that's a combo of ads and organic, then ask those people to become leads and make a micro commitment, not just hammering cold traffic with your lead generation ads. And then from there, the people that opt in sell to them in a human way and like get rid of the bullshit of all the scarcity and the deadlines and the timers and the fakeness and the, this webinar is live, but it's really not right. Like there's <laughs> limited spots, but there's not right. right like right. just get rid of all the bullshit and sell to them like a human being who's capable of making a decision. And it's those three things stacked one on top of each other while showing up and putting in the work consistently over weeks, months, years even that builds profitable, successful brands at the end of the day. So what's an example of, and I know this is a, a very difficult question to answer, but I'm going to, uh, I'm going to ask Perfect. it anyways. What, what are examples of these micro commitments that are kind of like proven to be successful? Yeah, Cause I think well, that that's something that a lot of people like, yeah, you can say, get them to make a micro commitment. I have no idea what the hell they want. So yeah. what's, what are some examples of some things that you can offer like a mini, uh, like a lead magnet, you know, that so are working? I'm going to say something that's probably going to like have some people scratching their, their head in our business, like in our company, we don't mm -hmm. have any lead magnets. Okay. So we actually treat the lead generation phase as simply requesting an invite to our digital program. We want somebody to say, Hey, I might have an interest in what you teach, what this program is all about. And I know that you're not just like dangling a carrot in front of me with this freebie. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm committing to say like, Hey, I understand that this is something that I might have to spend money on, but share some more information. So gotcha. in our business, what we do is request an invite, but that's not to say that like webinars don't work or uh, downloadable checklists don't work. It just has to have, context and make sense 
that you are attracting the right person who would potentially transact with you down the line, right? right. Like I always, I always get so um, aggravated when people use tripwires to self-liquidate their ad spend mm -hmm. because what's happening is you are using this tripwire to justify your ad spend up front, which means you're trying to make your, your hook, your ad copy more persuasive for a short-term gain, right? And then so you might get low-cost leads to something that's like really – um, really like engaging, but doesn't have any meat and potatoes behind it. Like doesn't lead to the next step. Like doesn't lead to your digital like sales process or your digital product or your e-com products or whatever the case is. But it's really fun to do like a quiz, for example, right? Mm -hmm. So I get frustrated when people get low cost leads just to get leads, to collect leads and then sell them something on the back end to break even on their ad spend what I would rather them do is create a dynamite nurture sequence organically with ads, with emails, and then attract the person that is most likely to transact with you to create. Cause like, that's where the transformation actually happens at the end of the day, right? Like when people become your customers, cause then if it's a coaching arrangement, you can ask questions, you can get feedback, you can like dive deeper and it's doing the work that gets the results. So like, instead of just putting freebies out there for the sake of growing your list, I mean, I'm, I'm a big believer in growing a list of buyers or at least potential buyers, mm -hmm. even if they take two years to become customers, still be there for that customer journey of theirs. Now, I, I'm, I'm guessing that your strategy or, or your philosophy works better with people who have kind of like higher ticket items. Um, because there is such a bigger play at the end. Right. Is that true? Or because, you know, like, let's just take digital marketer, for example, yeah. you, you, you know, them, you spoke there, you know, they sell a lot of their, their big thing is selling trainings and certifications. And then of course you could consider maybe traffic and conversion, another higher ticket item. So for them, it might make sense to offer that $7 lead magnet that then leads to a $20 thing. Cause the most money that you're going to be able to squeeze out of somebody in a year is maybe what, like. Well, if you do the DM certified partner, that's like right. five grand. So that's pretty the high. The war room mastermind oh. that they have, right? Like yeah, that's war, like war room. That's another, that's, that's another big one. But I mean, like a consultant uh, or, you know, the agencies that we work with, you know, they're selling 30000 40000 $50,000 a year programs. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that, that, that your philosophy works a lot better because there is this long, there is this longer term play that you have. Right. So let me, let me clarify. Digital marketer has a team that's able to fulfill on multiple product suites, multiple stages of their customer journey. When I speak of not having a tripwire, what I'm seeing in our industry is because the tripwire is the easiest thing to do. It's the easiest thing to like get out there than actually taking the time to create something that's quality product, a quality service. Mm -hmm. They go for these easy, quick wins, right? Because it is, it's like cherry picking the easiest thing to do out of a, a to-do list that's a mile long, right? Yeah. So I'm not talking about necessarily the digital marketers of the world. I'm talking about the bonds of two years ago or even five years ago when they're just getting started and they're a team of like one to five, right? So it doesn't have to be that it's a high ticket thing where you can run multiple phases of ads. All that it has to be is that your earnings per lead is higher than your cost per lead, right? So like, let's say, let's say you do have a, a $37 physical product, right? Okay. And let's say it's a planner. Okay. So it's a, it's a book planner that you do and people who love planning might also love a cleaning checklist, right? So you have this lead magnet that's a cleaning checklist. You put it out to the world. This is a real life example um, that I know the data behind. Mm -hmm. We might get leads to that cleaning checklist between 25 cents and 50 cents, right? As okay. long as that cleaning checklist is giving you $1.50, $2, $3 earnings per lead over the timeline that you're looking for that earnings per lead to come in it can make sense to have these multiple like steps in the process, right? 
So the, the only difference is that your earnings per lead are high enough to support Facebook advertising. But when you add in these other phases, the connect warming up phase and the mm -hmm. close sales retargeting phase, what happens is those people actually become, they lower your cost to acquire a customer. So yes, you might have more ads running, but all those touch points make your customer acquisition costs go down. So you get more for the money that you're spending on Facebook at the end of the day. So as long as your earnings per lead are where you need to deploy all of these stages, and if that's a $17 product, but your earnings per lead, you know, it takes only five people to get through there and you're getting leads for 17 cents in that specific industry. Of course, it's much harder to get 17 cents these days as a lead. It's not impossible for industries, uh, but if that's your numbers, you can make that work. Of course, what's going to naturally happen is you're if you're selling a high ticket, your earnings per lead are going to be astronomically higher than a $17 product. So it's going to be easier to have money to advertise out of the gate, right? Like you still have the same availability and potential to scale, mm -hmm. but out of the gate, you make one sale. Perfect. That can fund the rest of that system, right? When it's $17, you're like, oh shit, I got to sell, you know, I got to sell a thousand of these just to feel like I'm ahead enough to then continue to fund my ad or like my ad spend as well as running my business, my team, et cetera, on top of it. So right. both of them are possible. They just require like different, different criteria, not criteria, but like different considerations along the way. Gotcha. So this, this is going to be my final question. Okay. <laughs> so let's say Facebook shuts down their ad platform tomorrow. Yes. Already love this question. Okay. What's, what's the next thing? What's All the right. next step? Not just for you, but for all of your, for uh, your, your new students now. Yeah. So one thing that I am very vocal on is the fact that that could be an inevitability. Meaning if all of your eggs are in Facebook's basket right now, and that's working, amazing. And you should also be looking elsewhere, right? Like we've, we've seen it a few times this year when like Instagram goes down or Facebook goes down. And I mean, I, I bought extra like shares once the the Cambridge Analytica scandal came out because the stock price drops right so there's, <laughs> like there's a lot going on in Facebook world and so mm -hmm. my recommendation is to start identifying one the next platform that you are going to move to and right now the two that have my eye are YouTube and Pinterest mm -hmm. the reason being their evergreen nature and their like search engine abilities um, so those are, those are two things that I'm very fascinated and paying attention to. And then like really just understanding that ads is only one part of the marketing game, right? Like right. there's so many different channels and so many different ways to do things. So I'm a big proponent of getting out there and starting to build up traffic credibility organically that is consistently coming to you. For example, I write uh, every so often for one of our industry publications, and every single time I publish to that publication, I will get consistent traffic from that day where a surge comes because the article goes live forevermore, right? Like I've never had the traffic from one of those articles stop. So the thing with Facebook ads is as soon as you turn off your ad, that traffic is gone. Yeah. I highly recommend people start thinking of traffic sources that continue to reward you for the effort that you're putting in. in. The next five years, things will look very differently. And the more that you can start thinking in that nature of how do I do something once and get paid over and over again, the better position that you will be to weather whatever storms are coming our way in the next little while. Yeah, I love that. And you know what? The reality is that with anybody uh, or any type of principle that you that you learn regarding like messaging, it carries over to the different medias very, very easily. It doesn't matter if it's Facebook ads or SEO or YouTube or whatever. I mean, there are little tweaks that you have to make along the way, but the general principle is yes. going to remain the same. Yeah. Um, and it's going to resonate with the audience. So, I mean, I love that. So, um, Everybody, you've been listening to Amanda Bond, the ad strategist, all the way from Toronto, Canada. Um, what is the best way for people to get in contact with you? 
Yeah, if you wanna if you wanna come hang out, chat, and engage with us over on the Facebook page, you can find it at us at facebook.com forward slash the ad strategist or head on over to our website to read all about why I think Facebook ads are changing and why they're not working for some people at facebook.com forward slash agency. I love that. I'm actually I was on that uh that landing page, uh, just like right before we jumped on, I was like, this is such a cool landing page because I've never seen anything like it before. If nothing else, just for research purposes, just go to that landing page and check it yeah, out. Yeah, perfect. I, actually, I'd love to share somebody else's work um, because it's modeled off of Andre Chaperone. Have you heard of him before? No, never heard that name. Okay, before. so Andre Chaperone, uh, the site, so thatstrategist.com forward slash agency is modeled off the principles of sphere of influence, mm -hmm. just called a multi-page pre-sell site. So if you want to hear the psychology behind it, you can go read Andre's article. Uh, we link to it at theadstrategist.com forward slash S-O-I. And you can read all about the psychology behind it. It's so fascinating. Like I got, check it out. I got lost down his rabbit hole for sure. <laughs> I'm going to check it out right as soon as we're done. Um, okay. Amanda, who's the perfect person to reach out to you today? If you're an agency owner who's trying to figure out your own framework or perhaps would like to learn more about the strategy system, I'd love to chat with you because we are constantly getting asked for the best way to connect people with those who are running ads in this ethical, non-spammy way that's going to stand the test of time during this market correction that I'm predicting is on its way. And, the, and that's through the, the ad strategist.com? Yeah. Okay. Head on over to our website or the Facebook page. Perfecto. All right. Well, to all of our listeners, thank you all for tuning in today and make sure that you return next Thursday and every Thursday for the next episode of Operation Agency Freedom. Thank you very much.